Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. And as we enter scripture together, we remind ourselves, you are the teacher. You are the one who leads us into all truth. You remind us of things we've forgotten and you reveal things we've never seen before. So we invite you to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Jason Bandura. I'm one of the pastoral team here. I get the chance to give you the fourth lesson in a series under the heading of Live Your Call. You'll see that phrase on signs and documents all over our building. It serves as a vision statement for Harvest City Church, something we believe God wants to do in every life, that he wants to call you, and then he wants you to live that out. And if it happens, we have three pillars that we think will unfold. We think that when this happens, then God is giving hope to that life. He's transforming that life. And then today, my phrase is that he is inspiring action in that life. Action's a fairly basic word, but a significant one. When I was in elementary school and some poor English teacher was trying to drill the rules of grammar into my dull head, I think action is probably the only thing I got. I didn't get prepositional phrases and certain clauses and objects and subjects were a bit blurry, but verb, ooh, I got that one, action words. If you can do it, it's a verb. Any language that you're learning, you will likely start with hello and where's the bathroom, and then you'll move to verbs because that's how we put things together. So action matters. Probably we've all had the experience of watching a movie or reading a book and thinking, oh, this is so boring. I'm just waiting for something to happen. Action, we're looking for it. Maybe you've known a person of action. Maybe they were a mover or a shaker or even a breaker, but they were a man or woman who made something happen because they took action. And so there's lots that can be said about action in everyday life, but there's a fair bit that can be said right within the spiritual life too. In recent months, we've actually talked about a bit of a counterbalance to action. We had a series before the summer on rest. We've had multiple mentions of Sabbath practices and how these might inform our spiritual life. So there's something there that's almost a a bit of a counter in a way. Sometimes those discussions are valuable because they might be corrective to unhealthy rhythms that I have. They might even recalibrate ways in which I'm seeking my identity that are not serving me well. They might just generate some reflection so that I remember, Jason, friendship with God is always more important than frenzy on his behalf. Action's got a place, but let's keep things straight. That said, Maybe there's a basic truth that we can't get away from, that the essence of faith is expressed in action. We see it in our New Testament. They use words like grace and works. How do these work? Faith and works. How do these work together? Read Romans, read Galatians, bounce them off of James. You see an early church that's wrestling with the nuances of how faith and works bounce off of each other. Theologians have rolled this around for centuries. They'll continue to do so. If that's entertaining to you, jump in the pool. My point this morning is a little more basic, that spiritual life is physical. We are not just hearts, minds, and spirits. Every moment you live involves a physical embodiment of the things that are going on inside. We don't live disembodied lives where our beliefs are just imprisoned in our head and our values are just stuck in our hearts. Inevitably, our beliefs and our values come out. They're all expressed. You might love this or hate this, but it will happen. How does it happen? Through tangible, tactile, real in the moment, Words that I say or hold, energy that I spend or keep, actions that we assert or avoid. And it's always been this way. This is not unique to the Christian experience. If you've got a Bible, we're in Ephesians chapter 2 for the next few moments. Ephesians chapter 2 opens like this. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Remember that little word. And then he fleshes it out. How did this look when we were dead, living in a way that was, walking in a way that was killing us? It looked like following the patterns and course of the world. It looked like submitting to a spirit who works for disconnect and disobedience. It looks like the smallness and weakness that we probably all have some experience. 
Do we all have some firsthand experience of the smallness and weakness of a life that's lived for the passions of the flesh or the desires of the body and mind? Have we all had the experience of what Paul calls being children of wrath, which is an experience where alienation is being known rather than adoption, or a place where we find ourselves hardening rather than experience healing? This word walk is our simple little metaphor. It's the actions that embody our beliefs and values. And people far from Christ walk it out. And we were all there. This is what Paul's reminding us of. But he gets to verse 4 and he flips it all. It turns dramatically on two words. But God. Because you aren't the only one living out actions. You aren't the only one acting out beliefs and values. God has beliefs and values. And he acts on them. And he is rich, filthy rich in mercy. And it drives him to act. He loves us. He raises us. He saves us. He seats us in Christ Jesus. And so we get to verse 7 and Paul's got our eyes off of ourselves onto the Lord and his inspiring action. And in case our eyes might move, he drills it in just a bit deeper in verse 8. For it is by grace you're saved. Is through faith is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of works. No one can boast. For we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk. There's that word again. In them. And so if we were to outline ten verses, maybe it looks like this. That Ephesians 2 started with uh, our walk. If you can jump me ahead one slide. How we once walked has then been impacted by how God walks. And now we walk a different way. If any of you are viewers of the Chosen series, maybe this is your moment of Mary Magdalene bringing it all to a clear statement of, I was once this way, and now I'm another way, and the thing that happened in the middle was him. It's his action. It's divine action. But Ephesians 2.10 is worth lingering with. Here's a quick little Greek lesson. If you get past your English Bible, you peel it back into the Greek. Greek is a funny language that you can actually mix the words up and the meaning of the sentence will stay the same. It's a bit of a Master Yoda language. And because of that, the sequence of words doesn't impact the meaning. So how do you know where to put the words? Well, the Greek writers sometimes would put the words they really wanted you to see first. So that it wasn't about meaning, it was about emphasis. So when you get to Ephesians 2 verse 10, I'll let you guess what the first word in the sentence is. Because in my English Bible, it's for. Well, that's not very helpful. But in Greek, it's his because Paul still wants us obsessed as we now move our mind from a grace and a faith that saved us to some good works for which we've been created. He doesn't want us to get off the track and start thinking it's about us. It's still about him. So as he enters verse 10, where we're talking about good works prepared for us in advance to do, he still wants you fixated. Whose mercy has changed your life? His. Whose love envelops your existence? His. Whose are you? His. Whose hands are faithfully working to create you and then recreate you? Those are his. Whose actions are we to be obsessed with? Ours. No. His. And there are all these quick links as we read Ephesians 2.10 that might jump our mind back to the start of our Bibles. For we are his workmanship. God's building something. We are created. Oh, I feel like I'm, I'm funneling back to Genesis. It's like Julie Andrews saying in The Sound of Music. Where's that good place to start? At the very beginning. Let's do that. Genesis chapter 1. If you're a note taker, this might be your first point. Action is rooted in identity. But I want you to see it in Genesis. Creation story opens. In the beginning, God created. And he does, and he does, and he does, and he does. And there's five days of him. And by the day six, we get to this reading in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man. You'll see that weird little letter in brackets, which is just the Bible note telling us, it's not men, it's everybody. 
It's not masculine, it's humanity. God said, let us make them in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, livestock, the earth, creeping things. So God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. There's this massive shift in this point of creation. It has been five days of let there be, let there be, let there be, and there was, and there was, and there was. And now he says, let us make. Something's changed. Something's deeper. Something's more involved. There's something very special about you. All of the creation is special. You are a little bit more. What's going on there? Creation has this refrain. The creation story is very poetic. You don't need a literature degree to read it and think, boy, there's a lot of linguistic patterns here. It's quite repetitive. There's one phrase that comes up ten times that God's going to do something according to its kind, according to its kind. He makes those creatures according to its kind. He makes those plants according to its kind. It's just telling us that God loves organization and categories. If God had a sock drawer, whoo-hoo, you'd be impressed. But he also has this ability to create things that perpetuate themselves. People create people. Whales create whales. Ferns create ferns. These lines don't get crossed. God loves order. And so part of it's that, but the story's different because 10 times he said, create according to its kind, according to its kind, and now the creator wants to create something according to his kind. And he's queuing you up. This is the phrase, in his image. And scholars have studied it and wondered about it for ages. What does it mean that we are uniquely created in the image of God? Some people are sure it has to do with intelligence. Some think it's our ability to communicate. Some think it's about a moral spectrum that's unique to humanity and not the rest of creation. Some think it's about immortality, that we have this eternal ingredient in us that's different than the rest. You can figure that out over lunch. One of the things that makes me curious that I find interesting is is this. 200 years before Jesus, there was a king in Egypt who was building an impressive library. And one of the pieces that he wanted in his library was the Hebrew Torah, the Jewish books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But they were always written in Hebrew. So if you couldn't read it, it wasn't of any use. So he put together 70 Jewish scholars and recruited them. I want you to write this thing into Greek so the rest of us can have it, and I want one in my library. And so this team of 70 Jewish scholars wrote what now we call the Septuagint, moving the Old Testament law from Hebrew into Greek. And most of that's very boring. Who gives a rip, Jason? But in the Hebrew text, this word is really interesting. The image of God. And it's a word called selim, and you can word study it if you want. But in the movement from Hebrew to Greek, the Greek word is more interesting to me. It's the word icon. Oh, some of us know that one. Icon. What does that mean? Well, to some of my religious friends in different heritages, it means a very unique form of art often incorporated into worship settings. My Catholic and Orthodox friends could tell you all about it. My evangelical and charismatic friends are a little lost. We need a different definition. I go to my computer screen when I think of icons. And imagine a scenario. What if in order to create a document, here I am, created a document this week. What if in order to do this, what it required of me was first to go into my garage and build a computer from all my scrap circuit boards and then construct a keyboard from a box of Scrabble letters and then harness a lightning bolt to power my homemade contraption and then code a word processing program to get started? But instead, I had the luxury of clicking on a blue W and just starting. A whole bunch of brilliant people have made it possible. The icon takes me to a place I could never get by myself. That's the power of an icon. So how does this relate to creation? We've got creation telling us that you and I are the icons of God. Apparently, our lives are to open up avenues and make things accessible to other people that would never otherwise be accessible. If God wanted to remain hidden, 
you'd never find him. But he loves to be found. He's that parent hiding, seeking, waiting for that little kid to come around the corner so they can have that reconnection moment. And one of the ways that he delights to be found is he loves to be found through you. It is the height of the human experience to live as a divine icon. To visibly, probably imperfectly, embody the ways and values of God. And this is actually why you've been created. I bet you've tried a number of other ways to create that sense of meaning of why am I here? But here I am telling you that right from the creation account, the reason you're on the earth is to embody the values of God so that a click on your life might take people places they'd never otherwise go. So when we speak of inspiring action, I could come in today and give you a task list because we're all looking for more to do. Or we could just go down through the layers and get to some bedrock that's built right into the creation of humanity and the early church's discoveries on what it means to be people of action. Let's do the second one. You get to Genesis 1, we keep reading. Verse 28, he blesses them. He's made them. He's given them this task to be the divine icons. He is pleased with it. God blesses them. And then he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over fish of the sea, birds of the heavens, every living thing on the earth. He gives them two calls. They're to fill the earth and they're to rule the earth. There's an image of procreation and an image of dominion. I think we figured this one out. Eight billion in, I think we nailed it. I'm not so sure about this one. Probably worth more discussion. What does it mean to rule? This could quickly get corrupted by ego and self-centeredness. What's God calling us to? In the ancient world, especially within Egypt and Mesopotamia, you had rulers who loved to use the title that they were the image of God. Made them feel important, I'm sure. But here, Scripture uses the language not of some dominant gold-covered ruler, but of you. Everyone bears the image of God. Everyone, in a sense, is a royal ruler. Scan the pages of a history book and you will see kings and queens placing loved, trusted children on thrones and then asking them to steward wisely and to love well. And God, in line with the practice, he does the same thing. This is what he's tasked you with. This is what he's tasked me with. Maybe this sounds abstract. Maybe it sounds intimidating, but it's not meant to be. It's the end of Genesis 1 when we find out that we're created in God's image. You can read the whole rest of the Bible to see what he means, but sometimes it's good just to treat things in order. What do we know about God by the time we arrive at the fact that we are created in his image? We actually know quite a bit. What type of king is Yahweh? He is a king who breathes life. He is a king that brings order to chaos. He makes intricate, lovely plans. He organizes so that things will be fruitful. He is wildly creative. He loves variety. He delights in beauty. He creates possibilities. He provides for needs. He works for the vibrancy and flourishing of others. And then he says to all the ones who bear his image, hey, I'm exercising an inf my influence and authority in a certain way. I want you to do it too. Do it with me. Do it like me. And so when we set out to be people of action, we mimic our maker. And so rather than a task list that you might check off today, maybe I'm giving you a list of things that you might devote your life to. Go and be a ruler like the Lord is. Work to enhance the life of the ones around you. Work to bring order to chaos. Find actions that involve intricate planning and organizing for fruitfulness. Express creativity. Celebrate variety. Create beauty. Generate possibilities for people. Provide for their needs. Work for the vibrancy and flourishing of others. That's a big list. 
The point is that God's image bearers are created to live as icons. It's wired into our very existence. And so when we think of inspiring action, this is a little bit of what we might think about. Okay? So action is rooted in identity. Maybe a second point is that new people do new things. Let's jump back to Ephesians. 2 verse 10 will serve us well. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I grew up memorizing Bible verses from my NIV Bible. It used to say that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, prepared in advance for us to do. It's a tricky little phrase. I think it can get us unhelpful places. Sometimes it makes a suggestion like God's actually got a list of things for you to do and you're wandering lost through the world hoping to find that meaningful list. And if you don't find it, your life's been wasted. There's a whole bunch of important stuff that never happened. I'm not sure it's so much like a pressure-filled scavenger hunt as it is more spacious. That he's saying, God did this amazing work in you, on all of creation, and it has set you up to do any of a million things. One of my favorite New Testament commentators talks about this verse. He says it this way. He says, Christ Jesus is the sphere of God's new creation. What does that mean? I don't know. But here's what I imagine it could mean. That Adam and Eve were created in Eden... And they were tasked with tending and nurturing that environment. And everywhere they went and whatever they did, they were to act in ways that the world into which they stepped became more Eden-like than it was before. And so now you and I have been created in Christ Jesus. And we are also tasked to tend and nurture the life that is found in that environment. And as we move and act, we also extend the sphere of God's new creation. We establish and carry his values everywhere that we go. Our voices easily pray, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But our actions are our way of leaning into that prayer with our feet and our shoulders. And Paul was clear with us. He made it clear. We didn't always pray a prayer like that. There were times when we had smaller dreams and smaller purposes. But Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone, yes, even you, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation and new people do new things. There are things that are on your list and horizon now that the old you would have had no access or draw toward, but you've been made new. When I was in grade 10, I walked into the principal's office at my high school because I heard that I could get a form that would let me sign up to join student council. I thought I had something to offer. I thought I could make a difference. I walked in to grab my form. I asked. They said, it's easy. Just fill out this form. Write a little two-minute speech. Next week, there'll be a school assembly. You can give your speech. People will vote. <laughs> no. So I left the form and walked out because what kind of fool would stand in front of a crowd of people and talk for two minutes. <laughs> You'd have to be an idiot. And the holy one is the humorous one, as you have found out. There are tasks for which your old self was completely unsuited. That the new self has been wildly equipped for, even blessed to carry out. So if any of your mental grid is still being controlled by a view of your old self, it's time to discard, my friends. It is not serving you well. It is probably shrinking your life. Renewed minds dream new dreams. And new people do new things. So our task, when you, you might sit there saying, well, I don't know what they are. I don't have the dream. I don't have the task. That's okay. Oh, God's good to lead people who don't know where they're going. Here's how we do it. We walk with openness and availability. Because God isn't looking for your list nearly as much as he's looking for your yes. He's made you new. He'll lead you new places. But just carry a quiet confidence that says, new people do do new things. And I'm ready, Lord. 
if you've got them for me. So where have we been? Action is rooted in identity. New people do new things. Maybe a third stop. Inspiring action, which is our phrase, inspiring action inspires. This is another important word that I want to track just a bit. Inspiring. Where are my fluent Latin speakers? You're out there? No, you're not. You're all dead 1,500 years ago. But Latin does have this amazing ability to show us the roots of words, the meanings that brought them into existence. And so inspire has Latin roots. There's that in. Something's getting put into something else. What's getting put in? Spirit. Breath. Something is being placed in just like a divine breath. Boy, we have biblical imagery for this, don't we? It's to put breath or spirit into another. So action driven by my dream or by my own steam will probably be inadequate quite quickly in the life of faith. It might just be me being busy or me getting in a tizzy trying to possess something or prove something to someone. But inspired action involves God placing something in there. It's sparked by him. It's fueled by him. It's burned by him. Spirit-inspired action carries a different kind of power. And it's an inspiring power that starts in one life and quickly rolls to others. I've got one quick instance from each of the four Gospels. There are some huge ones we could pick. I tried to find four that you might actually overlook if you read too quickly. One of them's in Luke chapter 3. Luke 3 has John baptizing people in the water. The crowds are lining up. Some are coming very receptive. They want to be baptized. Some are coming very suspicious. They want to critique. John quickly says to the critics on the shore, Who warned you to come? Show the fruits of repentance. That's his key phrase. And the crowd in the water who are already responsive, they ask a great question. Fruits of repentance. Fruits of repentance. This sounds like an action step. What should we do? And the first person, John says, if you have two shirts, share one. If you have extra food, do the same. Then the repentant tax collectors chime in. What should we do? And he speaks to them specifically. Don't collect more than you're supposed to. And then some soldiers chime in. What about us? What's our next inspired action? And he says, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your salary. He's giving people at the very beginning. I love this story because here are people who have no spiritual maturity. They are at absolute square one. They're not even out of the water yet. And they're asking, what's my next action, teacher? And John is telling them, Take your next step. These aren't big ones. These are inspired actions, but they do not involve shaking the world or crossing the ocean. They're doing the same thing tomorrow that they did today, but they're doing it a different way because God's touched their life. And the action, as small as it might seem, is inspired by God, so it will have an inspiring power. There is someone who's going to get a shirt or some food that wasn't otherwise and is going to wonder what happened. There's a group of tax collectors meeting for next week's union meeting who are going to wonder why that guy's ledger looks a whole lot different than it did last month. There's a group of soldiers in the barracks that are starting to wonder what's wrong with Romeo over there. Inspired action inspires. That's one stop. What about a second stop? Go to Mark chapter 12. We have a famous story here. It's a quick little scene. Jesus is in the temple. He's teaching his disciples. And in a moment, out of the corner of his eye, he sees something noteworthy. And he points her out, that lady over there, at the giving box. Pay attention, students. She's dropping two coins in the box. That box has been paraded to by wealthy people all day long. They've dropped in big sums. And I'm telling you now, heavenly math says she gave more than the rest. What's going on? This is a woman who doesn't even know she's being observed. But her inspired action is going to inspire She's imagined the life of this woman. She's just going through her day. She's quietly living her life, but her action is inspired because in a moment faced with a life of lack, she very tangibly is entrusting herself to the invisible Lord. 
She's probably staring fear in the face throughout many of her average moments, and yet she displays devotion. And Jesus tells his students, watch, learn, don't ever forget what you're seeing right now. Jesus was picking an example hidden in the flow of a busy day and hoping for their sakes that that inspired action would inspire them for the rest of their steps. Go to Matthew 26. We're getting near to the cross. Matthew's only got two chapters left. Jesus is in Bethany. He's hosted in a home by Simon, who it seems used to be a leper but isn't anymore. He's anointed by a woman named Mary in a very unusual way with pricey perfume on his feet, with her hair. The expression is extravagant. The disciples are disturbed and they wonder about wastefulness. And Jesus confronts them. Don't you dare bother her. You don't have a foggy clue what's happening in this moment. This is an anointing unto my death. We're reading it 2,000 years later. It still doesn't make perfect sense. But Jesus' point was, he makes it very clear in the last verse, verse 13, I tell you, wherever the gospel's preached, this will be told too. Why? It's such an unusual action. I like clear actions, logical ones, ones that A, B, C gets me to D. This one doesn't make any sense. It has no precedent. There's no command. There's no rule. There's no example. It is just deeply personal, driven by gratitude. It is an expression of love, void of self-consciousness. It is meant for no one but the Lord, and the Lord shares a secret. Oh, this one will live on forever, friends. You can't read that story and then go do likewise. What you do is try to take some of the heart of that precious woman home with you and then figure out, Lord, what am I to do with this? If you would generate in me the sense of gratitude that you generated in her, what would it drive me to do? I guess that's my question. It's that song we sing sometimes, right? Gratitude. I'll throw up my hands. Praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah. And I know it's not much. There's nothing else fit for a king. What can you give? You give something that flows out of gratitude, and that is inspired, and that, in turn, inspires. Final stop in the Gospel of John. We're now at the cross, John chapter 19. Jesus is hanging. Jesus is dying. He sees his mother, and he sees John, often nicknamed the disciple Jesus loved. And he quickly weaves their lives together in a very unusual way. Mother, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. And from there on, two lives that have had connection, but oh boy, it's about to get deep. And for the rest of their days, they function as family members. What's happening? On a simple level, good son Jesus is caring for his mother. What else is happening? He's calling forth an act, an inspired action. And as it's acted upon, lives are going to be woven together in a new way. And love will be expressed. And love will be experienced. And maybe that's worth reminding ourselves. Sometimes we need the basic. We could go out there hearing the phrase inspiring action. And we could dream up the biggest plans we can come up with this afternoon. And start tackling them tomorrow. We can dream up impressive actions to take. But Paul will remind us all about wisdom and giftedness and power. And he will tell us that these things are nothing without love. So here we are reminded that spirit inspired action will always exhibit love and it will always expand love. And I'm sure there's more that we could say, but I'm sure that's enough for today. Stand with me and we'll bring this to a close. The fantasy of scientists and inventors is perpetual motion. That they could create a machine that once started, it would run itself, never needing more energy. Maybe even creating infinite energy and solving our environmental discussions. 
But it's an impossibility. The rules of physics say so. The laws of thermodynamics are firm. It would take a miracle. But it's a similar miracle that God invites us into this morning. He's calling us. He's inspiring action. Whether it's our very first awakening to faith or whether we have decades of living as a disciple, as we act, he works the miracle of perpetual motion. The inspired action inspires. And the life of God, the work, the, the power of God flows into one life and flows into other lives. This is the expression of God's love and power. I want you to pray with me. You probably need it, but the person beside you probably needs it more. So we should do it this way. Put a hand on your heart. Put a hand on a friend. And I want you to read this prayer with me. I think it will have more power if we do it together. Father, thank you that you are the master of inspiring action, that you exert your energy in love and kindness so that we experience life and fullness. In this moment, we pray for ourselves and for the ones beside us. Let us be your imitators and icons. Purify our hearts and empower our lives so that in all our actions, your divine attributes will be displayed more than distorted. Establish our roots so that we will always act from the identity you provide us in Christ, rather than for some foreign identity that we are seeking to establish. Root us in your love and fill us with your spirit, so that even our common actions will have uncommon impact. Blessing lives, bearing fruit. Eternal Father, here we are. Eternal Father, today we seek you, we trust you, we love you, and we make ourselves available to you. Here we are, send us. We pray in the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey everyone, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope you enjoyed it and found something that spoke to you or blessed you in some way. That really is the heart of Harvest City Church, that you take what you've heard, learned, or experienced here, and then go out and share that good news with others. So go ahead and post this video to your page, start conversations, and who knows the lives that God could transform through it. If we can support you in some way in this season, please let us know. Maybe you've decided to dedicate your life fully to Jesus. We want to hear about it and celebrate with you and help you in those first steps. Connecting in to share the joys and the struggles of life is why we're here. Finding community is super important too, so if you're wondering about any of our programs for kids, youth, or adults, just reach out to us by phone or at the link below and we'll be in touch. To all of those who are partnering financially with us, thank you for your investment into the Kingdom of God. It allows us to do what He's calling us to and reach even more people. For more info on that, go over to harvestconnect.ca slash give. If you haven't already, be sure to check out our live stream chat area at harvestconnect.ca slash live. It's a great place for interaction, commenting, prayer with our online hosts, and more. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our social pages and all that good stuff too. Take care, keep living your call, and we'll see you again real soon.